it may not feel like it every minute of the day right now, but I think our democracy is a major advantage in our ability to be nimble uh, and, and to self-correct. And a lot of people seem to look at China and envy their ability to have state-directed decision-making and martial resources in the long term. Uh, I'd take a representative democracy over a command economy uh, any day of the week. I don't care for the term decoupling because it implies that the United States and China are a couple. And when you're a couple, you can get divorced. But the United States and China are not in fact a couple because as Eli was just implying, other countries are gonna get a vote. The United States, particularly in Asia, has been a leader, not just because it was the principal provider of security related public goods, but also because it was the standard setter through which other economies and global and regional economic rules had to adjust and accommodate. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas and candid discussions from some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with two leading experts on U.S.-China relations, Eli Ratner and Evan Fagenbaum. Eli is the executive vice president and director of studies at the Center for a New American Security. From 2015 to 2017, he served as the deputy national security advisor to Vice President Joe Biden, and from 2011 to 2012 in the Office of Chinese and Mongolian Affairs at the State Department. He has held positions at the Council on Foreign Relations, at the RAND Corporation, and on the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Evan is Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he oversees research in Washington, Beijing, and New Delhi in a dynamic region encompassing both East Asia and South Asia. He has twice served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for both South Asia and Central Asia. Evan's career has spanned government service, academia, think tanks, the private sector, and three major regions of Asia. I had the great pleasure of working closely with Evan for seven years while he served as Vice Chairman of the Paulson Institute. He's played an essential role in crafting the Institute's think tank program and continues to be among the very best thinkers I know on U.S.-China relations. So, Eli and Evan, welcome to the podcast. And I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. And I think we're gonna be much better served if this is a forward-looking uh, discussion no need to relitigate the past, but I'm going to take the liberty of asking one backward-looking question, and I'm going to direct that at Evan, because Evan, in 2005, when you were at the State Department, you helped Bob uh, Zellick develop his responsible stakeholder speech. In hindsight, how do you look at that speech today, and uh, what term might you use rather than responsible stakeholder? I, you know, I think that that speech, it's been 15 years, it had a profound influence on the American debate about China. And I say that not just because I had a large hand in it, but because I think it foreshadowed two of the core debates that we see in the discussion of China's role in the world today. One really was to shift the focus from structure to conduct and behavior or to put that another way, from the mere fact that China had joined international institutions to the norms that China sought to promote within them. And then second to China's global role at a time in 2005 when most people I think were still focused on China largely in the narrow regional context of East Asia. So just to take those two briefly, it's hard to remember what the world looked like in 2005, but back then, 15 years ago, American rhetoric around China really was, I think, five to seven years behind the realities of Chinese power and capacity. So to put that another way, most of the speeches and documents 
that the United States government issued that talked about China still talked about integrating China into the international system. But structurally, by 2005, China already was in. It was a permanent member of the UN Security Council. It was a member of the World Trade Organization. It had signed every protocol on everything from ozone depletion to chemical weapons. So focusing on structure rather than conduct and behavior within those structures really was both behind the times and a somewhat backward looking view. So if you look at that speech, by recognizing that China, structurally speaking, was a stakeholder and putting the emphasis on responsible conduct as the United States defined it, it really was, a, I would argue, a profoundly different way of looking at China that in its time uh, was uh, quite different from the way the US talked about it. And then second, um, you know, by the first half of the 2000s, China was already beginning to take on a global role. And whether it was former Secretary of State and Treasury James Baker talking to the Chinese about Iraqi debt relief, uh, or it was the way that the Chinese began to play a role uh, in Africa, not just on the economic side, but on issues like Darfur and Sudan, uh, China already had global reach. Uh, and the United States really tended not to look at China that way at that point in time. So on a whole variety of issues, Iraq, Afghanistan, Africa, global energy markets, which was an issue in calling out Chinese energy mercantilism that Zelik really focused on in that speech. Um, I think the speech foreshadowed some of the discussion we're having today. And the discussion we're having today really is not about structure anymore. It's about conduct and behavior. To put that a little bit differently, it's not about forms, it's about norms, and whether China seeks to, in the first instance, impose its own preferred norms on the global institutions the United States helped to establish. And second, we're talking about Chinese power in a much more global context. So I think in that sense, it really, uh, it was prescient and it foreshadowed where we are today. Now with hindsight, a lot of people look at that speech and they view it kind of as a scorecard rather than as a concept. So people will, I, I think, kind of argue with a straw man. They'll say, you know, the speech was a naive expression of the American view that China should play its appointed place in the American dominated international order. And by that standard, that view failed. Um, I think that's kind of a straw man. You know, I mean, nobody who'd ever, ever spent five minutes around China thought China was going to be content with its appointed place in an American dominated international order. So I think if we think about it as a concept rather than as a scorecard where we grade China pass fail, it was prescient and it was profound. But now we're in 2020. The world looks a lot different. China's a lot different. Xi Jinping's a different kind of leader than the leaders of China back then. And so the challenges that China poses both to the United States, but also to its preferred norms are very different and so we need to adjust. The last thing I'd say, Hank, is you know the opposite of a responsible stakeholder is an irresponsible free rider. And the United States should have no interest in promoting the idea that China should be an irresponsible free rider. So in that sense, it's just logical that, particularly in the context of that time, that was what American policy should have been striving for. But today, I think as Eli will agree with me, we need to update our approaches to reflect the reality of how China is exercising its power and using its capacity today. Okay, so Eli, now for the present. So you're hearing people talk about the, the right way to think about China is that this is a, another Cold War. And you, you have said that that isn't the right way to think about it. Explain to us how, why you think the Cold War analogy is a wrong one and the right way to think about China today. Yeah, sure. And, and let me just add my thanks, Hank, for being here today and always happy to join Evan in, in conversation as well. Um, you know, there have been a lot of folks using the Cold War analogy uh, to refer to where we are now or where we're headed with China. And I had written a piece recently arguing that I don't think that's the right framework. Um, there is a degree to which history is rhyming here with, with the Cold War with the Soviet Union, but there are many ways in which it's different. Of course, the economic exchange between the United States and China, the degree to which China's integrated into the international system in the ways that Evan was just describing. And most importantly, in some ways, the degree to which, uh, in a comprehensive fashion, it's very unlikely that the world is going to divide into two or more very clean blocks. Uh, and that many countries, whether it's in Southeast Asia or South Asia or even uh, parts of Europe, uh, are going to want to be interacting with both the United States and China, and they're not going to be ready or wanting to sign up with, with one camp or the other. And if you take those factors into account, 
uh, I think planning your strategy, either wishing for and driving toward a Cold War, or arguing that preventing one is, is the most important thing at all costs is the wrong way to go. Um, you're not gonna, I, I don't think it's wise in the first instance to desire a Cold War framework where we cut off uh, economic exchange with China completely, trying to get China completely out of the international system as we know it, or try to court uh, some kind of comprehensive anti-China alliance or Asian NATO or whatever concept you want to use. I just don't think that's viable or in America's interest. So sort of cheering for a Cold War doesn't make sense to me. Um, but neither does setting a, your framework for strategy around avoiding one as well. And I worry that some of the folks who have been holding that up as that which to be avoided um, are often making the argument that the China challenge is much overblown, which is something I don't necessarily agree with, or that leaning into a more competitive strategy is somehow going to lead to inevitable conflict or a self-fulfilling prophecy, and therefore we shouldn't do it, uh, and we need to back off. Um, I, my view is that it's going to be a much more differentiated competition that's going to defy any singular approach. I think given the issue and the issues inside the issues, they're going to look very different, and there's not going to be a single bumper sticker that you can use to describe the way that we're going to approach China on climate change and technology and defense issues and North Korea and every other issue under the sun that's in the uh, in the basket of issues. So you see a lot of folks striving for that. And, and my advice is, let's not try to make that bumper sticker for the relationship. I think what we need to be doing from a US perspective is focusing much more on the United States, that the, the China challenge right now is about us. It's not about them. Um, it's about our own competitiveness. That, that, in my view, is the problem to be solved, not just in a narrow sense of just investing at home and fixing ourselves at home, but also um, in terms of our international economics and our diplomacy and our technology and innovation and our, our defense and, and security. Um, I want to approach the China challenge with a stronger, more capable, more confident United States. I think that's the right way to frame the strategy challenge rather than a conception, a very particular conception about the bilateral relationship self, itself, much less how we should be trying to change China. So Eli, that really leads to my next question because first of all, I really agree with you. I mean, if we don't have a strong economy at home and a model that others want to emulate, this isn't going to work. I mean, the Chinese understand strength, the rest of the world will. We have to have a political system that works. We have to lead internationally. We have to lead dip diplomatically. We have to lead militarily. So having said that, tell me, as you look at this st strategic competition, adversarial in some areas, but clearly a strategic competition, what, what are our comparative strengths and um, what, what is Chinese comparative strengths and weaknesses as you look as you look forward? You know, that's a really important question, and I wish people asked it more often because I do worry sometimes that our response to the China challenge and our concerns about where we see them gaining power and influence has led us to want to, in some instances, replicate their mode of expanding their power and influence. And there's this uh, degree to which sometimes it looks like we're trying to out China China when in, the, in, in, the, in practice what we should be doing when we're thinking about renewing and enhancing American competitiveness is thinking precisely about that is where do our align, where do our advantages lie rather than where are the areas so we they have their industrial policy so we need our industrial policy they have their belt and road so we need our belt and road I don't think that's the right approach so I think one of the you know, the, one of the core principles that I would bring to, to the, the conversation and a, and a reassessment of U.S. strategy would be exactly to identify those. And I think the, the answers are a few, and I'd be interested in terms of our advantages, I'd be interested in uh, Evan's list. I mean, one is clearly our openness. Um, and that's not something that we should do naively, and we have to protect ourselves from that being abused. But I think the degree to which the United States is open to people, uh, is open to ideas and talent and, and diversity, and that we can draw on the strengths from 
the whole world so that when we think of the China challenge, it's four plus billion, which constitutes what we're drawing from the world against or vis-a-vis -vis China's 1.3 billion instead of limiting ourselves to our own 350 uh, plus million. So I think our openness is really important in all of its uh, manifestations. Um, our alliances and our ability to work with allies and partners is fundamentally an advantage of the United States. I think the, you know, the, the Center for New American Security, my home institution, we did a major congressionally mandated study over the last year that we released in January. It was comprehensive across several domains of the competition. And what was clear, whether we were, we, we broke the competition down into uh, defense and economics, technology, diplomacy, ideology, et cetera. What was clear is that in every one of those domains, it was very hard to find an issue where the United States was better off acting by itself or unilaterally. And, and the China challenge in many instances, is a, it's a challenge of scale and scope. Uh, and we need to be thinking about what are the countries that we need to be working against with, not, again, not in a coherent, comprehensive anti-China coalition, but on a issue by issue basis, what are the types of coalitions that we can be working with uh, to advance our interests? And then the, you know, the final thing that I'll mention, it, it, it may not feel like it every minute of the day right now, but I think our democracy is a major advantage and our ability to be nimble uh, and, and to self-correct. And a lot of people seem to look at China and envy their ability to have state-directed decision-making and martial resources. Uh, and that may work sometimes in the short term, but in, in the long term, uh, I'd take a representative democracy over a command economy uh, any day of the week. So I think those are just some of the advantages, but certainly there are others. Okay, Evan, uh, what do you add to that? And, and, uh, and, and what are China's advantages? Okay, look, I think the core of the problem, particularly in Asia, if you're trying to compete with China is that you're fighting the map and you're fighting economic gravity. And the United States is fighting both of those. You're fighting the map because China is the only country in Asia that's geographically contiguous to every subregion of Asia, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia. So if you just visualize a map in your head and you let your eye go around a map, China's the only country that's geographically contiguous to all of those regions. That's important because on something like infrastructure, for example, where the United States doesn't like China's Belt and Road Initiative and wants to compete, you can build a highway from Tajikistan to Western China. You cannot build a bridge from Kyrgyzstan to California. And so you're fighting the map and the answer to that is to compensate for the lack of presence by becoming what I would call the standard setter. Which brings me to my second point, you're, you're fighting economic gravity because China plays an outsized economic role, not just as a trader, but as a builder, a lender, and an investor in two thirds of the Eurasian landmass. And in two thirds of the Eurasian landmass, the United States is diplomatically challenged and it's commercially irrelevant. All of Central Asia, except for Kazakhstan, where the United States is a big investor in two extractive sectors, and that's it. All of South Asia minus India, uh, mainland Southeast Asia, even Thailand, where the United States has been starting to fade. And that's really more of a Japanese story than an American story. And so competing with China, in my view, it's not rocket science. In the first instance, we have to be mindful of what Eli said, which is you don't win by trying to out China China because you can't mirror those two Chinese strengths of the map and economic gravity. But second, because it really requires three basic ingredients. It requires presence, it requires that you be the standard center, and it requires that you foster and offer alternatives to China's offerings. And on all three of those, the United States, in my view, is largely striking out. If you look at the trajectory of US policy on presence, I look and I see a United States that is withdrawing from international institutions, withdrawing from trade agreements. The United States wants to be the standard center, you know, trade and investment standards in Asia, if you pull the thread over the next few years, are likely to be set by two major trade agreements, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and the United States is in neither of those. And then in terms of fostering and offering alternatives, I think the United States is frankly doing more whining than competing. And it has what I would call an attitude rather than a policy, and certainly not a strategy. 
And so that's the core of the problem. So I think when I look at U.S. weaknesses, it's the map and it's what I called economic gravity. But I think the U.S. has a lot of strengths. And I think the core of Eli's list is essentially for the United States to be a standard setting nation. And the U.S. really prospers most and becomes more present when it plays that role, whether it's on innovation standards, technical standards, trade standards, investment standards. And I see the U.S. walking away from that. And I think that's what the U.S. needs to arrest pronto, because if it doesn't, nature abhors a vacuum. And what it's going to find is not only does China set some standards, but many countries not called China will also set standards. And as an American, I'm not content simply to have not China be the standard setter. Having other countries set the standards while the United States has its nose pressed against the glass looking from the outside, that's not optimal either. That's not a world I want to live in. Yeah, and if I could just build on that, I think, I, think, I mean, those are terrific points. And, and uh, you know, the, the phraseology that I use sometimes for, for what I think has been lacking at times in the Trump administration is that they're often toward China, they're often confrontational without being competitive. Uh, and I think that it's very true in the ways that uh, Evan has described on an issue like 5G uh, or other, you know, you go down the list and it's very clear uh, what the administration doesn't like that China's doing. Um, they've taken some actions to try to blunt that behavior, but there's very little in the way of an offering of alternatives, which is fundamentally necessary. And you take a, even an issue like 5G, you know, you pick a, you pick a, a middle economy country and they're being offered uh, Huawei at a better price than they're gonna get from anyone else. They probably are aware of some of the security vulnerabilities of that. But at the end of the day, when they rack it and stack it, if you don't give them an alternative, uh, then just wagging your finger at them or threatening them with sanctions is not going to be a good policy. So I do think, again, in, in almost every domain of this competition, there's a real need for the United States to be putting forward ideas either to how to bolster and renew existing institutions, but I think actually more importantly, as Evan's describing, um, to be innovating and entrepreneurial and thinking forward about what do we want the rule set to be on these issues. And I think that's going to take you know, Evan talked about the, the attitude uh, of the Trump administration. I think it's going to take a little bit of an attitude change more generally uh, for Americans who have been very comfortable wanting to fall back on the post-Cold War system and talking about the rules-based order as if we could only get back to what we had before, then we'd be fine. Uh, I think the reality is that um, aspects of the old system uh, are no longer sufficient, in part because of China's rise, in part because of uh, changes in international politics and issues that didn't used to be on the agenda. And instead of seeing China as a revisionist country that's trying to disrupt the old system, we ought to be competing with them in terms of building a new order and new rules and new institutions. And that's going to require a little bit less of a defensive crouch from the United States. So that, that may take a little bit of a mind shift as well. Yeah, amen. I mean, the, uh, the, even if China didn't exist, there would be a real challenge in coming up with the new treaties, the new protocols, the new rules for today's world with technology moving so quickly. And of course, standards are gonna be the name of the game in all kinds of areas. And I think economically, standards are the protectionist tool of choice right now and, and, and regulation. So that's where a lot of the battles can be fought. And that leads to my next question. And Evan, I'll start with you here. Because you worked with me. You, you know, in 2018, I gave a speech where I talked about uh, an economic iron curtain descending in both countries. And that seems to be even truer today. And so the question is, how much decoupling can we afford? How far can we go without shooting ourselves in the foot? Are we fully accounting for the costs? I don't care for the term decoupling because it implies that the United States and China are a couple. And when you're a couple, you can get divorced. But the United States and China are not in fact a couple because as Eli was just implying, other countries are gonna get a vote on the outcome. So you have more than two players here and there's gonna be a lot of jockeying. And that's important because I frankly think on technology and on the things you're talking about, flows of 
goods, capital, people, technology, mm -hmm. data. Uh, there are alternatives that are neither Sinocentric nor American centric. And what we're heading for is a function specific and issue specific international order characterized more by fragmentation than by unipolarity one way or the other or bipolarity on the other hand. I mean, we've already seen a test of that in the trade area. You know, when President Obama used to talk about trade rules in Asia, he was trying to sell the TPP domestically and he'd phrase it something like this. He'd say, if the United States doesn't write the rules, China's going to write the rules. And so if that had been correct, and when President Trump withdrew the United States from the TPP, what should have happened? China should have become the rule runner. But in fact, that's not what happened. What happened was the 11 others got together and created a rule set influenced by the United States, but with neither the United States nor China as part of the agreement. And I think on data and a whole variety of other issues related to technology, that's what's likely to happen is we're going to see fragmentation. Now, your question asks, is that good for the United States and what are the implications if the United States doesn't want to engage. Um, I think the implications are terrible, but I think in part they're unavoidable because of the nature of technological innovation and the way that technology is evolving. If you think about the flow of innovation from the 1940s to the 1960s, it was really weapons and military innovation that was driving commercial innovation. So out of the four war babies, uh, British radar, German rocketry, American nuclear weapons, American computing, came a whole variety of commercial innovations. But with the development of commercial microelectronics and semiconductors from the 1960s up until the last 10 years, that really reversed. And commercial technology really began to drive spin on to weapons innovation. But if you look out into the future, the emerging and foundational technologies, things like artificial intelligence enabled applications, new synthetic and composite materials, uh, biotech and pharmaceutical innovation, quantum computing. These are things that are intrinsically dual and multiple use in nature. And for that reason, because you have a much more integrated innovation system, it, begins, it becomes much harder to bifurcate in terms either of your export controls or your policies. And so what that means is inevitably, there are going to be areas where the United States and China are going to want to be more self-sufficient, decouple, as you put it, from each other. And at minimum, that means more redundancy and resiliency in a supply chain. But I think in a lot of areas, we're going to be we're going to see wholesale what I would call deintegration, uh, and that, as I said, I think is likely to lead to fragmentation in a whole variety of areas that will have a really a not a very salutary effect on the future of innovation. But I see it as largely unavoidable. So the question for the United States is how to navigate that world in a way that, as you, Hank, have put it. Um, doesn't sequester so much technology inside the United States that the United States in its attempt to attenuate the progress of innovation in China ends up attenuating the progress of innovation here. That's the danger. But frankly, I don't see an easy way to navigate it because of the, some of the technologies we're talking about. So I'm gonna give Eli the related question, which is a $64,000 question. So what do you think is a proper balance between national security and economic progress and success in the United States. How do you think about that, Eli? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good question and I, I liked Evan's answer. I mean, I, I'm not sure that's the only trade-off between security on the one hand and uh, economic prosperity on the other. I do think it's important uh, to note that there are, of course, people who are ideologically committed to decoupling and separating the relationship between the United States and China. But I also think that the forces that are calling into question the degree of interdependence between the United States and China are driven not just by that. And it's important to recognize that. I mean, there's a, there is a legitimate set of concerns about human rights in China and ensuring that American companies are not directly or indirectly supporting or abetting that behavior, I think that's shared on both sides of the aisle. We had a day recently in July where the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the Democratic staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee released a, a report raising concerns about China's uh, high-tech authoritarianism and how the United States needs to approach that. On the very same day that the Trump administration was issuing new entity list uh, listings related to uh, forced labor in Xinjiang. And I don't think that's sort of wide-eyed anti-China sentiment. I think that's legitimate concerns about the human rights situation in China and ensuring, again, that American companies are not, the United States, uh, or the American companies are not participating in that. So we need to be 
cognizant of that. Um, and we need to be cognizant of the degree to which China was engaging in anti-competitive behavior uh, that was disadvantaging American companies. And, and maybe that was okay at a time when the United States was largely uncontested as the uh, premier technological superpower. But now that China is catching up with, and in some instances outpacing the United States in certain areas, it's not sure, it's not clear that's a fair bargain anymore. So what are we gonna do about that? Uh, and so to me, Hank, your question is the right question because it is about balance and finding the right balance between any number of issues in this, in this space. Again, it's not just security and prosperity, it's how do we support innovation on the one hand without introducing a whole bunch of inefficiencies associated with industrial strategy or state planning or picking winners? How do we deal with the espionage problem in the United States and intellectual property theft, which is real? Uh, but how do we do that without weakening our research institutes and our universities? Um, and you kind of go down the line and you know, one answer to that, at least where I am in my own thinking on this, is that one thing that we really need, I mean, you have, you have to have an orientation, I think, that you want to get the balance right in a way that represents our interests. But one of the things that we're deeply lacking right now is any kind of process inside the US government to actually adjudicate these really hard questions. So for me, thinking forward, I think the question is not just what's the right answer in terms of what's the right amount of tariffs or what's the right amount of export controls or investment restrictions, but also what's the process that you're gonna set up inside the government to actually answer those? What's the bureaucracy? What's it gonna look like? How are you gonna engage with the private sector? How are you gonna engage with civil society? Because these aren't problems going away and I don't think you want just a narrow decision on what's the right balance, okay, we have it, go implement, but rather let's set up the right process because at least my time in the White House and, and I'm sure uh, you guys will both agree, um, the economic issues were never that well integrated with the national security issues and the technology issues were all over the place and they still are. They're at DOD, they're at Commerce, Treasury's involved, the State Department's involved. And I think what we've seen out of the Trump administration is a very inconsistent ad hoc approach is not just that there are different views uh, inside the administration of try, trying to achieve different things, but that they haven't had a, a process to try to adjudicate in, any, in that in any way that it can cohere into something that looks like a coherent strategy. It's a great one, and I can't resist entering in here because I look at it very much the same way when we're talking about technology, <laughs> that clearly we need to decouple in certain areas to protect our national security and our economic security and our health security. Of course we need to do that. But the question here is how do you have a process so you don't go so far, you end up hurting us because the rest of the world is going to want a economic relationship with China. You alluded to that before. So what's the right balance and what's the right process? And so th th to me, that's critically important. Now, you got to the next question I was gonna ask, so I will start with Evan here. Can I, can I but, just come in on yeah. that for a second? So, you know, I, I think you're right. But if you, look what, if you look what just happened in Europe on 5G, where the United States was able to move the British, for example, from a place that really was pushing back at the trajectory of US policy to coming around. If I were sitting in Washington and I had a very hawkish and exclusionary view on this stuff, I would feel like the United States had some juice on this. And so I would not make the presumption that you just made, which is that other countries are simply gonna circumvent US export controls exactly. and US preferences. But rather I would think I had some SWAT actually right now. To, and so where we're heading is, is toward a more fragmented world where OECD economies may move in a US direction while economies in Africa and Central Asia don't. And as an American, we may calculate that that's okay with us, that kind of fragmentation in the, in the international system. Yeah, as, as I said, Evan, that's, I think I didn't say anything that disagreed with that because I said we have to figure out where we're gonna draw the line, okay? What is most important and what's realistic to can get done? And so there's certain things we need to do for national security and for economic security but we could, you and I could spend a lot of time talking about the, the, the technologies today, and we've talked about 
the fact that uh, that that now the rather than rather than economic linkages blurring you know mitigating national security uh, linkages national security is now uh, led over into the economic side and and that's become militarized and if we if we now try to build a a, a moat around and sequester all sorts of technologies, th this is gonna be self-defeating. We have to be very careful and select what we absolutely need. And I still will say, if we go so far, and some of the discussion I've heard in Washington goes so far that I think it harms us and not China. But I wanna go to the, the next question. And I'm gonna start with Eli because as you and I have talked about this, Evan, and I say, what do you prioritize? You all say we have a big tent. We don't have to prioritize just one thing. And I think Eli had said something very similarly. But I'm going to try to put a sharper edge on this and see if I can get either one of you to be <clears throat> more specific on it. Because right now, we are hearing, it just seems like things are coming at us, you know, every single day. We're, we're, we're hitting China. And is it, is it when we're hitting them on Taiwan, we're hitting them on Hong Kong, we're hitting them on human rights, we're hitting them on religion, we're hitting them on technology, we're hitting them on standards, we're hitting them on, uh, on the security competition. And so the question I have is, as we prioritize and think about this, what are the areas where you think we have the greatest opportunity to have some success and get some traction. What are the areas where you think we absolutely need to have some progress? You know, we, we talk about climate change, we talk about denuclearization, there's all kinds of, of areas. And I agree that they're all important, but it's hard to fight on all sides at once where have we got the greatest likelihood of finding some common ground, getting some change? And, uh, and as you look at the, the national security and the economic security of the United States, any comments on what are most important? So I will, uh, I will start with you. Eli made some comments. I'll start with you and then we'll, this is a $64,000 question. We'll finish with, with Eli. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's a great question and we, and we could spend several more hours uh, discussing it. Um, let me frame my answer before I just start ticking off some items. I think the way that I would think about the problem, and again, uh, referencing this, this major report that we did at, at CNAS, where we looked at the breadth of the competition, because I do think we have to think about it as a comprehensive competition. It doesn't mean competing everywhere over all things every minute, um, but it does mean that we need to be more competitive in the many uh, dimensions of the competition. And then within those, identifying what are the most important highest priority issues. And, and the way that I would frame that largely is there is a, in many instances, a similar problem in each one of these competitive domains, which is that America's strategic advantage is diminishing. Um, in part because China is growing, um, but in part because of decisions that have been made in Washington and elsewhere. And so to arrest and reverse uh, that trend and or sustain the advantages that we think are absolutely most important is the way to think about the problem. Um, and so, you know, there's some basic shoring up that the United States needs to do that maybe goes without saying in terms of like Evan was talking about showing up and being present and going to international summits. And um, of course we have work to do at home on our own democracy and some of the competitive issues around uh, investing domestically. But as it relates to China policy a little bit more specifically um, in terms of where the opportunities are to renew American competitiveness, again, there are dozens and dozens and dozens. I think things that, that where I would put some of my focus um, one would be, I do think there are opportunities for greater coordination and cooperation on technology policy between the United States and some subset of partners. So to avoid that kind of moat that, uh, or at least the smallest uh, moat possible, 
uh, that you both described. I think it is going to be really hard work, um, but we have to be talking with uh, the Japanese and the Europeans and the Australians and the Koreans and uh, several others about is there ways that we can coordinate on this and start thinking about um, not just, you know, reshoring in America first, but rather building secure and reliable supply chains, setting norms around human rights standards, uh, sharing information on investment screening and uh, those types of issues, I think will be more successful in terms of what we're trying to achieve. We'll be able to bring more leverage to bear on Beijing on issues where we need them uh, to take more notice and doing any of those things by ourselves is absolutely not in our interest. And so I do think that's an area we talk about allies, allies, allies a lot. For me, that's that's a place that I would put a lot of focus. I think within the technology domain, uh, I've been convinced, I'm not a technologist, but I've been convinced by experts that the issue of semiconductors is vitally important. And the types of um, proposals that are on the Hill now in terms of boosting uh, domestic spending and research and development on this, as well as tighter restrictions on some exports of semiconductor manufacturing equipment is probably called for in terms of the long-term competitiveness, economic competitiveness of the United States. Um, I think the Taiwan issue ranks at the tippy top uh, in many ways in terms of really needing a rethink from the United States about where do we see our relationship with Taiwan going, where do we see trends going, and how do we ensure that uh, the democratic government there persists and that there's peace across the, uh, the strait. And I think that's an issue that obviously could grow to be absolutely prominent in the US-China relationship. And as long as we can preserve uh, what we think is important about uh, Taiwan's democracy, we ought to be thinking hard about how to avoid that situation from becoming a situation of uh, real confrontation. So those are a few issues. I don't want to exclude. That's not at the exclusion of many other important ones, but those are some that are at the top of my list. Thank you. Evan, over to you. I think the United States is doing a reasonable job of reinforcing deterrence in the Asia Pacific. It's not a complicated thing. You invest in allies, you invest in presence, you invest in force modernization, and you invest in certain kinds of deterrent capability. So I, th I think it's clear what's needed to be done and what can be done. And as Eli implied before, there's broad bipartisan agreement on it. So at the tippy top of my list, therefore, if we're making progress on reinforcing security-based deterrence, is returning the United States, as I said, to its standard setting role so that the global economy operates off of rules, norms, and standards that the United States prefers and that work for American firms, American workers, farmers, ranchers, and American people. The United States, particularly in Asia, has been a leader, not just because it was the principal provider of security-related public goods through alliances, forward-deployed military presence, and carrier battle groups. It was also the leader because it was the demand for which Asia's export-led economies powered their way to prosperity, but also because it was the standard setter through which other economies and global and regional economic rules had to adjust and accommodate. The United States is never going to have the demand profile again that it did in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. As a source not just of intermediate, but even of final demand, the American consumption pull is shrinking, which is why the intra-Asian share of demand is rising in every study and on every trajectory. And that means if the United States wants to be more than a security provider, more than just to put it pithily, the Hessians of Asia, <laughs> it needs to do more than just fall back on that demand role. It needs to be the standard setter. And that's where I, I, I don't see the trajectory as being particularly positive. So I think the next administration, whether it's a second Trump administration or it's a Biden administration, really needs to engage on that set of roles and missions. And that's the core of it. The one thing we didn't talk about, Hank, that I thought your question was implying was whether it was anything that the United States and China ought to be cooperating on, because they're not cooperating on much anymore. And if the United States and China can't cooperate in the face of the worst global health crisis since 1919 and the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression, then I think we have to presume they probably can't cooperate on much of anything. And that's not a recipe for a particularly stable world. I don't think it's necessarily an intellectual problem. They could, for instance, be cooperating on vaccine development 
or I'm preparing the manufacturing capability to scale up to 7 billion doses of a vaccine. But they're not. And that suggests that actually third countries and third parties, as I was saying before, are going to have to collaborate in new ways and make the Americans, the Chinese, or both of them, the spoiler of meaningful collective action. And I think that's a trend set that the United States needs to watch out very carefully for. Because as I said, and I would conclude here, just because the global order isn't Sinocentric doesn't necessarily mean it's one that's conducive to American interests. So I think the first order of business is to return the United States to that fundamental standard setting role, and we're losing sight of that. And uh, I sure meant to, to, to get to that second question, because my question was, where are there areas where we've got a chance to work with China that are important to us where there's some chance of success, okay? And, uh, and, and I think the world's gonna be a pretty dangerous place if, 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 if we can't do that. But I, I think this has been a terrific discussion today. I want to end with a backward looking question that's very personal. And so I'd like each of you, and I'll, I'll start with Eli, to tell our listeners how and when you first got interested in China. Sure, uh, happy to do that. Um, and uh, I think it's actually telling in terms of some of the generational shift in terms of China experts, because you do have a lot of folks uh, in, in sort of generations uh, above mine, I'm in my mid forties now, who were, got interested in China because they, were, they went to China, Taiwan as missionaries, or they were interested in East Asian history or art in college and sort of backed into a, a policy career. Um, I got into China, uh, interested in China in the late 90s, um, purely from the perspective of great power politics and great power competition and my interest uh, in that and identifying China as what I thought was the coming most important, uh, interesting challenge and issue for the United States. 9-11 happened uh, while I was getting my PhD. Everyone in the world uh, went to learn Arabic and, and study the Middle East and I, uh, moved to China and learned Chinese and, and continued to uh, study Chinese foreign policy and, and US strategy toward China and it's been uh, fixed on there. But that was, the, that was the orientation that got me interested in the country and then the history and the people and, and, and everything else followed from that, which I think is actually different than the experience of a, a lot of folks of a different, of a different generation, but that's what, that's what got me hooked. And boy, it's made a big difference. So uh, thank you, Eli. Evan, I know yours goes even further back. So tell yeah, us about it. Yeah, I'm old. I'm, I'm, Eli's in mid-40s. I'm 51. So But you started earlier. You started as a baby. Yeah, you know? as a baby. So, so for me, it was my uh, eighth grade social studies teacher who was from North Carolina teaching in New York City. Her name was Bo Devins. And she had a real passion for China. We had an eighth grade world cultures class in social studies. And we had to vote for the culture we wanted to study. I think I voted for Africa. And China won. And then I just uh, found it fascinating. So I talked my very understanding parents into letting me fly off to China to learn Chinese in the summers. So that was summer of 1985, 1986. China was a lot different then. If you think about 1985, it was only seven years into the economic reform. It was only nine years since, uh, since Mao Zedong had died. Um, and so my career trajectory with China has really seen China change a lot uh, over time. Um, and then I've, I've you know, moved around and seen it in different aspects as an academic in government in a private sector and, and otherwise. But, um, but that's how it started for me. It's that kind of youthful interest in a place and, and then you get to fly off there and, and, and see it. But China's changed a lot in so many ways that were inconceivable even back then. Well, thank you both. This has been a terrific discussion and I, I will tell you, I learn from you both and uh, you know, I'm just, delighted that you are as engaged as you are in China because boy this is a problem right now and we need to to, to come up with a new framework for US China relations and I bet you you both will play a role in helping to set the intellectual 
uh, rigor behind a framework like that. So thank you both. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot.